Hello friends, my name is JJ. So check out this cool t-shirt from Threadless. It's called the Madness of Mission 6. It was drawn by an American artist named Travis Pitts and it reimagines the story of Pac-Man in a dark and creative way. Pac-Man, seen here, is depicted as some sort of sullen pill-popping astronaut and he's haunted by the ghosts of his four dead colleagues. The implication is that he is responsible for their deaths and thus needs to self-medicate to alleviate the guilt. Travis's drawing is really quite ingenious and this has been a best-selling shirt for many years now. Chances are high you've probably seen somebody wearing it. But what if I was to tell you that everything about this clever drawing is based on a lie? So this is Pac-Man. It is a Japanese arcade game that was released in May of 1980 by the Namco Corporation. You control this little yellow thing, and the objective is to eat all of the dots while running away from these multicolored things. The game was considered very revolutionary in its time because it was the first to feature characters as opposed to just guns or spaceships or whatever. According to the instructions that were printed on the original Japanese arcade cabinets, the yellow thing is called the Puck Man, while the multicolored things are called this. This is a word written in what the Japanese call the katakana alphabet. They use it mostly to phonetically transliterate foreign words. It reads monusuta or monster. When Namco imported the Pac-Man game to the United States in the fall of 1980, they changed the name Puck-Man to Pac-Man for hilarious reasons that I'm sure everyone has heard a million times by now. Hey, you know Pac-Man? I know of him. Well, Pac-Man was originally called Puckman. They changed it because, uh, not because Pac-Man looks like a hockey puck. Paku Paku means flap your mouth. And that they were f worried people would change, scratch out the P, turn it into an F, like. But they kept the name Monsters for the other guys, as we can see in the translated instructions that appeared on the American cabinet. But of course, that name didn't stick. Even though we were told to regard the Pac-Man bad guys as monsters, they looked more like ghosts to us. And so that is what we gradually started calling them. For example, in this 1982 bestseller, How to Win at Pac-Man, the book notes that the monsters are also known as ghosts. And in this 1982 ruling from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, in which the Pac-Man people were suing the makers of this terrible game for copyright infringement. The judge refers to the things as ghost monsters. This also wound up being the name used in some early Pac-Man merch, as well as in the Pac-Man cartoon. Uh oh I gotta get away from those ghost monsters! Where are the ghost monsters? But not long after that, the monster part was dropped, and they soon became known as just ghosts in all American media. In March of 82, Atari released a home version of Pac-Man, which came with a richly illustrated manual that clearly depicted the things as ghosts. You can see a similar interpretation of the characters on the cover of this player's guide or in this magazine ad. Things were made even more obvious on the boxes of some of the hideous Pac-Man knockoffs that they released in England, like Dot Gobbler and Dot Man. Today, the ghost assumption is so deeply culturally ingrained that people cannot quite process the possibility that they were ever intended to be anything else. As we can see in this carefully controlled experiment, you consider yourself a bit of a bit of a Pac-Man fan, right? Absolutely. Uh, I, I I love Pac-Man as like a cultural touchstone, cultural artifact. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Absolutely. So we see you have some of these Pac-Man props here. Yes. Yes. What, what do we have? Uh, well, this looks like a, a lamp that is a ghost. I can't tell from the color if it's meant to be... Oh, it looks like the colors are cycling through all four of the different uh, typical ghosts. The what? The ghosts. Like, they're your standard four ghosts. The ghosts. Each. The ghosts. <laughs> and the ghosts are what? They're, what do you mean? They're ghosts. They're ghosts, okay. See, this is, this is the crux <laughs> of the issue here. Is that what if they're not ghosts, Maxwell? Why what do you, you think mean? they're ghosts? Uh... Because of the shape? I don't, just, that's what I was told by Namco? So Maxwell wasn't quite correct there. As we discussed, the Namco Corporation actually initially described these things as monsters and not ghosts. And it was only because the American public so stubbornly insisted on seeing them as ghosts 
that eventually the official terminology changed. But let us now just take a step back for a sec and discuss why this phenomenon even occurred at all. A good place to start might be that appeals court ruling that I mentioned earlier. The Namco people were suing Philips Electronics for selling an obvious Pac-Man ripoff called KC Muncher. And at one point in the ruling, Judge Harland Wood Jr. offers a quick summary of what the Pac-Man game looks and plays like. And here is how he describes the so-called ghost monsters. The four monster characters are identical, except that one is red, one blue, one turquoise, and one orange. They're about equal in size to the gobbler, but are shaped like bell jars. The bottom of each figure is contoured to stimulate three short appendages, which move as the monster travels about the maze. Their most distinctive feature is their highly animated eyes, which appear as large white circles with blue irises and which look in the direction the monster is moving. Now, for some reason, a bell jar shaped creature with three appendages at the bottom and big expressive eyes registered to the good people of America, not as a monster, but a ghost. If you look at like the little, the little sort of figurines of them or, or yes. their depictions, is there anything about them that sort of inherently tells you that they're ghosts? Yeah, like they're, they have that sort of, um, you know, childlike ghost, like, you know, ghost costume sort of look where like a sheet and the two black eyes, like yeah. Charlie Brown dressed as a ghost kind of okay. look. But this sort of reaction just raises further questions. A ghost is the spirit of a dead person, right? So why do we think that a dead person is a sheet with eyes. Where the heck did that come from? So the Victorian age in both Britain and America was a time in which people of all social classes started taking an obsessive interest in all things death and occult, especially ghosts. The Victorians were fascinated by ghosts which made it necessary for the popular culture to come up with some sort of standardized depiction of what a generic ghost looked like. And what they came up with was a humanoid figure in drapey white robes, or possibly even covered by the robes entirely. This is what ghosts look like on new middle-class novelties like Halloween cards, and was the standard ghost costume in vaudeville performances. Now, we don't know exactly why they settled on this particular cliche, but there are a few plausible theories. The main one is that that since a ghost is supposed to be a dead person, a sheet ghost in some ways resembles what a corpse would have looked like in the 1800s. At one time, it used to be the tradition in Christian countries to bury people wrapped in linen. That's what the Bible says they did with Jesus, after all, as was the manner of the Jews, according to the Gospel of John. In practice, this could mean covering the body with literal sheets of linen, as you can see here being done to Queen Victoria herself, or just dressing the body in special burial garments made of linen, which were sort of like pajamas. This tradition was actually kind of already on the way out by the Victorian age, as it had become increasingly popular to just bury people wearing normal clothes. But the thinking is that the tradition was still well known enough to the Victorians to have people associate loose, billowy, white clothing with death. So in theory, a ghost wrapped in a sheet would have the appearance of someone who just wandered out of a tomb, in the same way that today we might expect a zombie to be wearing a nice suit and tie, because of course that's what we bury people in now. The other theory is just that ghosts have always been considered these kind of flowy, floaty, wispy creatures, and one way to achieve that look, particularly on the theater stage, was to have the ghost wear flowing robes that kind of create the illusion of wispy fluid movement. White is likewise a reflective glowing color that looks holy and otherworldly, while we tend to associate cloaks or capes or robes with characters who are magical or mysterious. But in any case, as the years went on, this stereotypical depiction of a ghost got more stylized and abstract. In 20th century America in particular, it gradually became associated with a certain kind of low-effort Halloween costume, which then itself became a hyper-stylized cliche in its own right. And so, by the 1980s, we could look at something as abstract as this and have it somehow register as the spirit of a dead person. Now, while it is lovely to imagine that Pac-Man was fighting ghosts of the Anglo-American cultural tradition, this was very much not the original intent of Pac-Man's creator, Toru Iwatani. We can see that in his notes, he always calls these things monsters. And if we look at the original source material itself, it's pretty clear that they were never intended to be airy spirits at all, but rather far more corporeal beings. Have you ever seen the intermissions? You know, in the mm. original Pac-Man? Yeah. Of course, yeah. So, uh, do you remember them? Do you remember what happens in them? I, usually they are in 
like animations of Pac-Man chasing ghosts or ghosts chasing Pac-Man, and then usually there's a little swerve at the end of each one. Yeah. Well, yeah. do you remember? Do you remember any? Do you remember what specifically happens in any of them? I remember one where uh, Pac-Man's being chased. He's being chased, and then something happens off screen, and now he's chasing the ghost, but he's like twice as yeah. twice the size. That's, yeah, that's the one. The, I that's can, the first that's one. one. Do you remember any of the subsequent ones? Hmm. Not off the top of my head. See, that's this is interesting to me because. I feel like the Pac-Man intermissions are not well remembered mm -hmm. in in sort of our sort of cultural imagination. Sure. But when you watch them, they will make you second guess the idea <laughs> that they're that the things are ghosts. Okay. Right? So let's let's watch uh... Yep. Mm-hmm. So this is the one that you're thinking of. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, but then let's keep watching. So this is the second intermission now. <laughs> okay. okay. I have never seen that before in my life. Okay, and now watch the third intermission. What? So in the second in the second one, the ghost gets caught on like a nail. Yeah. And his his I, I guess it's like a sheet or it's some sort of costume yeah. that's torn and you can see like a, a fleshy leg. Yes. And then in the third one, he goes off screen and it looks like he, his whole costume has been destroyed and he really is just a leg and eyeballs. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but anyway, hmm. here's an ad for a Puckman handheld game in Japan. Okay. Look at the way the ghost is depicted in this. Oh, I love it already. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god, I love it. This is a good find. But you see, like, <laughs> how the ghost is depicted? Sure, he's got legs, he's got teeth. Uh, and he's and, and you notice he's got that arms. Like, he does have arms, but you also sort of notice that he's um he's kind of more of a sort of like jellyfish kind of thing. Like <laughs> Maybe. he's a, he's Maybe. a sort of like blob I mean like the thing is like he's just like a mythological creature. You, like, in your mind, like, if you could reach out and touch that that ghost monster, it would be gelatinous. I think so. I think uh, it's sort okay. of, it comes off as sort of rubbery. The point is like <laughs> it's it's not it's not a ghost as I think. Like, I, I think that if you watched that uh, ad, yeah. knowing nothing about anything, and you looked at that, you would not think that's ghost. a ghost. You'd no, think no. that's just some weird creature. I suppose that's true. Are you gaslighting me? I'm not gaslighting <laughs> you. This is what I mean, right? It's like, you know, because that depiction of the ghosts is, I think, sort of incongruous with the fact that we imagine them to be ghosts and yeah. our cultural understanding of what a ghost is, yeah. I think that we've sort of collectively, as a culture, just blocked out that part of their mythology. Well, at some at some point they became ghosts, right? Because like They did become ghosts eventually, yeah. right? So it's like like there's a Pac-Man show out right now and it's called like Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures. Right. And they're very much portrayed as like the spirits of dead people in this kind of thing. Oh, right? But it's like that is very much an example of how sort of uh like that we as sort of North Americans had an understanding of what these creatures were. Mm -hmm. And the the Namco of Japan people eventually sort of retconned the characters yeah, yeah. into uh into something that was sort of in sync with our mythology. Now in Japanese folklore, a big thing is the obake. Obake are mythological creatures that we don't really have an equivalent of in our culture. I've seen the word clumsily translated into things like goblin or ghoul, but you're really better off just sticking with obake. They're basically just imaginary characters that can be anything. There are traditional obake, like the one-eyed umbrella or kappa or long-necked maiden, as well as unique obake that people make up for the purposes of stories or cartoons or video games. In 2010, Pac-Man creator Toru Iwatani gave an interview with Wired Magazine where he reflected on what made his game so unique when it was first released. Japanese youngsters really wanted ghost type characters, not necessarily modeled on creatures, but things that didn't really exist in this world. Even within animation, they want characters that are the products of the writer's imaginations. In North America at the time, the games were about car races or warfare. They wanted games that simulated the real 
real world, whereas Japan wanted Oto Gibanashi. I strongly suspect that in the original Japanese, Iwatani was saying obake type character instead of ghost type character, which is why they put ghost in quotation marks. Even though the Japanese do have their own word for ghost as well, yuri, the confusing nature of the word obake to English speakers means that that word is sometimes translated to ghost as well, which just adds to the confusion. In that same Wired interview, Iwatani also describes the Pac-Man monsters as being inspired by two pop culture characters that he really grew up loving as a kid in the 1950s and 60s. The American cartoon character Casper and a Japanese character called Obake no Kutaro. I personally do not see a lot of Casper influences on the Pac-Man monsters, which does make me question the degree that this was an actual influence on Iwatani versus just something that he has learned to say now that his characters have been retconned into American style ghosts. But in any case, it is worth remembering that as much as the character is called Casper the Friendly Ghost, in the original cartoons, Casper was never intended to be a literal ghost in the sense of the spirit of a dead person, but rather a made up fantasy creature, almost Obake-like, you could say. According to the Casper fan wiki, after a few years, the original ghost premise of the character was later abandoned in favor of the idea that ghosts were merely a type of creature, similar to ghouls, goblins, etc. He was thereafter portrayed with feet, and shown to have ghostly parents and became slightly slimmer. Now the second influence Mr. Iwatani mentioned, Obake no Kyutaro, is, as the name suggests, a much more traditional Japanese Obake character. And I think it is very easy to argue that the Pac-Man monsters are supposed to be based more on him than anything else. So Obake no Kyutaro, or as he is sometimes known in English, Q the Spook was a manga character created by Fujiko Fujio, who wasn't actually a real person at all, but the pen name of two manga artists, Hiroshi Fujimoto and Motu Abiko. You may be delighted to learn that they were also the minds behind Doraemon, the friendly cat robot from the future. The first Q manga was published in 1964 and tells the character's backstory. Q pops out of an egg while the kids are playing ninjas in the backyard, and then he becomes the one boy's lovable oafish companion, and they go on to have lots of fun adventures in cartoons and video games and cheaply produced plastic merchandise. Now, the design of Q is interesting. He's a sort of penguin looking thing with arms and legs and big lips and hair, but his body is also sort of a sheet. Like when he walks around, you can see that there is clearly something under the sheet, and there are times when the edge of the sheet gets caught on something and he trips or whatever. So it's kind of strange because he is a solid physical creature, but then he also wears a sheet, kind of like an American ghost, but then the sheet is also like part of his body or something. He basically comes off as a thing that was inspired by an American ghost, but with the premise reinterpreted in some weird new direction. Anyway, the point is that the norms of this character clearly inspired the way that the Pac-Man monsters behave in those little cut sequences that so freaked out Maxwell. Like Q, the Pac-Man monsters were also clearly intended to be solid creatures with sheet-like bodies that may or may not have also been their literal skin. They weren't spirits, just monsters. So in conclusion, the Pac-Man ghosts, some of the most beloved and recognizable characters in video game history, are really just a byproduct of what we could call a culturally biased assumption on our part, which is to say they were designed to be one thing, but thanks to the strength of American cultural convictions, we were incapable of seeing them as that, and through sheer force of will, transform them into something else, and now sell t-shirts based on that assumption. It is a fascinating case study of how things can get lost or reimagined when different cultures try to communicate with one another. Okay, maybe it's not that fascinating. Well, Maxwell, have I sufficiently made you question everything you thought you knew? Um, well, you know, JJ, things like Pac-Man are always evolving, uh -huh. right? And so while I learned something today about the origins of the ghosts and whatnot, I think um, I can safely proceed in life <laughs> as describing the enemies in Pac-Man as ghosts. Uh -huh. I think that around the world, people will still... Uh, no, I think so. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I think that we as a culture have mm -hmm. objectively won this argument yes. regarding what these things yes, are. Yes, yes. But it's interesting. I had never seen those cutscenes before. I'm not even totally convinced they're real. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, I eat this, I gobble this stuff up.
So I love it. Thanks, Maxwell. Hey, thank you. Good to reconnect over this kind of stuff. Absolutely.